and a very warm welcome as we gather in the sacred sanctuary of St. Mark's Church in Sacramento. I'm really glad that you're here today. We're in this sacred space for this community on the sacred land of the Nisanan, the Miwok, and the Maidu. This worship service invites you to review again and maybe upgrade your spiritual compass as you navigate the rugged terrain of 2022. Today, the two parables are short parables again. The first one is the parable of the lost sheep, and the second one, the parable of the lost coin. Both are find, found in the Gospel of Luke. Becky Matt will be reading for us in just a few minutes. But first, let's join with Mark Slaughter in singing, I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. Shout when the Spirit says shout. I'm gonna shout when the Spirit says shout. I'm gonna shout when the Spirit says shout. And obey the Spirit of the Lord. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Luke. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. All the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around Jesus to listen to him. The Pharisees and legal experts were grumbling, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus told them this parable. Suppose someone among you had 100 sheep and lost one of them. Wouldn't he leave the other 99 in the pasture and search for the lost one until he finds it? And when he finds it, he is thrilled and places it on his shoulders. When he arrives home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Celebrate with me because I found my lost sheep. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who changes both heart and life than over 99 righteous people who have no need to change their hearts and lives. Or that woman, if she owns 10 silver coins and loses one of them, won't light a lamp and sweep the house, searching her home carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, celebrate with me because I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, Joy breaks out in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who changes both heart and life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're living in difficult days. There's a lot of cynicism and anxiety in the air. And so it's often difficult, I think, for us at this point in history to have an experience of pure, unmitigated joy when something really good happens. I truly believe that celebration is a Christian virtue. It's really important that we all know how to celebrate and experience joy in our lives. And for some people, that takes some extra effort to make sure it happens. When we tune into the deep joy in our own hearts, then not only our own lives are healed, 
but our communities are healed. This week in the life of the St. Mark's community, we had a really wonderful experience of joy. Vivian Noble Klein was reluctant to share ahead of time the news that she was about to have a liver transplant. Uh, she was anxious that uh, something may uh, prevent the transplant from happening, and so she didn't want to be disappointed. Vivian has been waiting for over a decade for a donor to come forward who would be able to give half of their liver to her so that a new liver could grow in her and the donor would have a liver growing back relatively quickly. Vivian's liver was diseased and for more than a decade she has been dealing with terrible symptoms uh, and they have been preventing her from living her life to the full. A few weeks ago, Vivian discovered that her work colleague, uh, Greg, her husband, was willing to donate half of her liver in order to give Vivian new life. Her name is Shannon Steen, and we're grateful to Shannon for her incredible gift of life. Last Thursday, the 10-hour transplant surgery took place at UCSF in San Francisco in the medical center. Shannon left the hospital on Monday, fully recovered, and Vivian is rapidly recovering now too. She's in great spirits. And the outpouring of love from family and close friends as she has gone through this experience has been truly amazing, truly wonderful and very humbling. I invite you all now to share in that liberating joy that Vivian and Greg and the whole family are experiencing. Feel free to sing, to dance, to shout for joy. When all seemed lost, suddenly the path to health opened up for Vivian. Even the angels are dancing. Both of today's parables are about something being lost and then found and a celebration party follows. The first is the story of the shepherd with the flock of a hundred sheep. The shepherd finds that one is missing. Now again, with this parable, like with the others we've explored, don't get caught up in the details and speculate about what may have been going on. This is a wisdom story designed to convey some truths. One detail that is important that you should know that at the time of Jesus, shepherds were people with a really bad reputation. They were frowned on and, and were singled out uh, in the society uh, for basically being disreputable people. Uh, they could easily be added to that list that we often hear in the New Testament of tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners, and so on. It was extremely unlikely that such a person would be interested in pursuing one sheep that had strayed away from the flock. Incidentally, the story implies no moral judgment on the standing of either the one that got lost or the 99 left behind. Luke puts these stories in the context of a conversation with religious leaders, but Matthew doesn't when he tells this story. So I have a sense that Luke was wanting to preach something through retelling this story in the way he did, uh, but Matthew didn't. What I hear from both stories in the Gospel of Luke and in the Gospel of Matthew is a truth about God's kingdom, God's family. And that truth is that every individual is precious. Everyone is worthy of celebration. No matter their personal or their moral history, everyone is a beloved child of God. And that includes the disreputable shepherd. In the second story, we hear about a woman who loses a coin. We can only speculate about the actual value of that coin. It's described as 10 drachmas, whatever that means, 10 silver coins. Whatever their intrinsic value, they had a lot of value to this woman. Some people think that the 10 coins were part of a married woman's headband which would be extremely precious to her, and the loss of one of them would be a serious matter. 
It was really wonderful in preparing for today, reading through the commentaries. I came across a commentary from a theologian, Carol Shurston LaHood, and Professor LaHood spent some time in Yemen uh, researching uh, biblical history, and she gathered together a group of Yemeni women to reflect on this story. They loved it because they recognized in this woman's experience things that resonated with their own experience. Firstly, the sheer panic of losing a coin. They too would be terrified if they lost some money. Secondly, the darkness of the house. Houses back then and still now, many of them don't have any glass windows. So inside the house can be very dark even during the day. And then inside the house, as you live in the desert landscape, uh, the house can be very dusty uh, and very difficult to stop it from being dusty. Hence the need for a broom to enable the search. And then, of course, there's the problem of finding a single coin on a dirt floor covered with reeds and rushes. The Yemeni women also resonated with the celebration that the woman had with her friends when she found the coin. That's exactly what a woman would do today in this same situation. Then as now, there was a clear distinction between a man's world and a woman's world. And there's a sense in which the lost sheep is the man's world and the, the lost coin is the woman's world. Women in uh, the time of Jesus and, and now would often be included in men's events. They would be there, but men would not appear when women were gathering in community for a women's celebration. Women had power and they knew it. Now the Gospel of Luke was written for primarily a male audience. Women appear more often in the Gospel of Luke than they do in the other Gospels, but they tend to appear in social contexts that look more like the Greco-Roman world than the ordinary world of uh, the common folk living in Israel at the time of Jesus. The women's story connects with the story of many women from poorer backgrounds. And, and it's those people from poorer backgrounds who were the, the audience that Jesus was typically speaking to most of the time. The same could be said of the shepherd. For, for men also, uh, there may be in these stories an affirmation of being a, a low-income, low-status, ordinary man who's being lifted up as a moral example. Just as Jesus lifts up the Good Samaritan, who we'll be exploring in a couple of weeks, um, the person you don't expect is the one that Jesus lifts up as the person, as an example. In this case, the, the shepherd and the woman. These are two basic faith and moral lessons that I hear in these stories. The first and simple truth that comes to me from these stories is a reminder that every human being is a unique and priceless creation of a God of love made in God's own image. A God who calls us to be partners and collaborators in the task of God's ongoing creation. This reality is planted deep in every human being whether or not they know it or aware of it or respond to it. We're all created to be godly, to be compassionate and whole. Yet, as we know all too well, too many people in the human family, this buried treasure deep in our souls has never been unearthed. So millions of people are simply not aware that they are a beloved child of God, whom God has called into a loving relationship. You and I have that promise of a relationship with God. And it's a promise of pure, unmitigated joy when we remind someone who they really are, when we enable them to dig deep inside themselves to discover that they are indeed, as we saw last week, a precious pearl, beloved of God, 
Everyone is enabled to be a transforming power, bringing compassion and healing to the human family. Let me mention again that parables are Middle Eastern wisdom stories. They are not designed to convey just one moral truth. They, they are not designed to be picture stories. They, they are designed instead to push us, to challenge us, to make us think and work through what these stories might mean for our lives. So as I preach some learnings from these stories, you may be finding something quite different that speaks to you that never even crossed my mind as I was preparing for this sermon. Having said that, I would encourage everyone, as you reflect on these stories, to look in two areas. One of them is what you might call the interpersonal, and the other one is the intrapersonal. It is a given that we are beloved, unique, priceless creations of a God of love. But clearly, all of us have room for growth. For myself, I find myself challenged in my spiritual and in an emotional life because I know I'm constantly growing and becoming more and more uh, somebody responding to God's love and grace, but never complete as a child of God. There's much that's incomplete about me, and I trust is probably true of you also. We make assumptions drawn from our own culture about who we are. Uh, our, our, our society helps us define who we are. Uh, take, for example, gender identity. We have all been conditioned into thinking who we are in terms of male, female, or whatever, and we're living in times now where those are being questioned and we're looking more deeply at what it means uh, to have a specific gender identity or not. The world of gender identity has been opened up by many people in recent years, enabling us all to take another look at who we are. We know, too, that most of us operate behind some kind of mask identity that we present to the outside world. We have defenses that enable us to cope with uh, life as we navigate the ups and downs of our lives. Some of us allow our identities to be formed by other people's expectations of us. And for all of us, I think there is an undeveloped side of our personality which has been pushed down or even ignored over the years. This other you or this shadow self may put in an appearance from time to time or be a regular visitor in our dreams. It may even find political expression in our community as we're all gripped by this sort of alter ego, this shadow side of ourselves. I find it helpful in my own personal self-exploration to routinely ask myself about the lost sheep or the lost coin of my soul. Where have I spiritually gone astray? And where might I have to go looking to retrieve what has been lost? What precious heart of compassion has been lost that requires me to lighten inner light and sweep up the dust so that I can find it within my heart and self. I find it difficult enough to raise these questions for myself in my own personal exploration and, and to find an honest answer so there is no conceivable way that I could ask specific questions that relate to you and your life. These are questions we all have to formulate as we do our own self-examination and exploration. Suffice to say that historically Christianity in our missionary zeal has framed itself as saving people who are out there. Uh, the non-believers, the pagans, the people with primitive religion, we're saving lost souls. But the, the act of salvation or redemption for Christian people is not only an outer reality, a social reality, 
It is an inner spiritual and emotional reality. Back in the previous chapter, Jesus uh, uses another image as a parable. He says, the next time you put on a dinner, don't just invite your friends and family and rich neighbors, the kind of people who will return the favor. Invite some people who never get invited out, the misfits from the wrong side of the tracks. You'll be and experience a blessing. They won't be able to return the favor, but the favor will be returned. Oh, how it will be returned at the resurrection of God's people. Retrieving what is lost, both in our stories and in our own spiritual journey, can be very hard work. It can be very frustrating if we're going to invite those parts of ourselves that we rarely see into the banquet and to be seen and known. Retrieving what is lost is not easy. It's hard work. It can be frustrating. How far did the shepherd have to walk? Did he maybe start out going in the wrong direction and have to retrace his tracks? Did the woman spend several days of sweat and toil and fear that the coin would never be found? Despairing. The quest isn't easy, but the harder the struggle, often the deeper the joy when the lost is found and the wholeness is restored. And what a celebration can happen. Oh, break out the great feast so that we can share and celebrate together. Jim and Jean Strathley are now going to share with us a song with words written by Reverend Dan Damon. Dan is a retired pastor in the Bay Area, and we're grateful for his words that, that Jim has set to music. You value each of us the same. You value each of us the same. So to this broken world you came to change a heart, to change a name, to bring your love. You walked as one of us to save. You wept with friends beside the grave. You felt the lash, yet you forgave to show your love. So many killed by hate and fear call from the ground to help us hear the raging witness that may clear to love In you the nameless dead are found To you our angry voices sound Speak from the sky, speak from the ground Move us to the same So you endured the cross of shame To give to all your holy name The name of love O God of love, dear Christ of pain And spirit let us again begin to build on earth your reign, your reign of love. We move now into a time of prayer. Let's pray together. 
And when I say, your kingdom come, please say, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Liberating God, we give thanks for that amazing assurance of your love that comes to each one of us, wherever we may be on our spiritual journey. As we seek to go deeper, we pray that you will always be our companion. May we always rejoice in your mercy and grace. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Redeeming God, your mercy is boundless, and we pray that your peace may cover the earth. Wherever there is bloodshed and violence, we pray for your peace. Wherever there is oppression and fear, we pray for your justice and hope. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Incarnate God, in Jesus we see your word made human. May we see your face in the faces of those who are lost or struggling. May we seek out the lost of our society, the forgotten ones, and work with them to bring hope and tranquility to their lives. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Healing God, we pray for your presence with those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. For those who are grieving, those listed on our church's prayer list, those known to us who need you today, in the quiet we remember them in your presence. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Calling, God, you have constantly raised up people of faith to proclaim your good news. Pour out the spirit of your love on your church and on this congregation, St. Mark's, to stir us in our calling as your servants in this age. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Welcoming God, you call all humankind to your heavenly feast. We pray for the nations of the world that healing may prevail in body, mind, and spirit for all, and that the beloved community may come alive throughout the earth. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And we say together, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Just a few announcements. Firstly, to say that uh, we have been having the conversations among the leadership of the congregation, and the decision has been made not to resume worship on the first Sunday of February, a week from Sunday, uh, but to wait another two weeks. So we're now projecting that we will recommence in-person worship on Sunday, February 20th. Assuming the Omicron uh, situation continues to progress in the direction it looks as though we're going. So please plan, those of you who are coming to church, to be here Sunday, February 20th. And then the office will be reopening Wednesday morning, the 23rd. Just one morning each week from 9 to noon. A reminder uh, that we have Zoom coffee hour every Sunday at 10 o'clock and at noon. 
do please come and join in. If there are those of you watching, uh, either on YouTube or on Faith TV, who would like to join in the Zoom coffee hour and get to know people in the St. Mark's community, please go to our website where you will be able to find the, the links and you can send us an email uh, requesting to be added to the newsletter list and to the list for my weekly emails. I send out an email to the congregation with a video every Thursday. The church's website is St. Mark's, S-T-M-A-R-K-S-U-M-C dot com. Again, S-T-M-A-R-K-S-U-M-C dot com. St. Mark's United Methodist Church, all lowercase. benediction today, I thought I'd read some words from the great Buddhist monk, leader, social activist Thich Nhat Hanh, who died this week at age 95. Brother Thich Nhat Hanh said this, you must love in such a way that the person you love feels free. The source of love is deep in us and we can help others realize a lot of happiness. One word, one action, one thought can reduce another person's suffering and bring that person joy. I pray that you may bring joy this week to yourself, to others, and to the entire world.
Amen.